didn't get to before the exam, but that will be on the final. One is reactions of alkenes, um, chemical reactions, and the other is ar aromatic compounds. We'll talk about those two today. All the reactions of alkenes are called addition reactions. And you'll see why, but basically you're adding two things together, adding something to the alkenes. Um, up to this point in this chapter, unfortunately, it's not been that exciting. Uh, we've just been kind of talking about the structures of these organic compounds and what their names are and how to draw them, and that's all fine and it's necessary. But what's really interesting about these compounds is the way they react together and the way that we can control which specific product we're going to make based on what kind of a reaction we're going to do. And this is how things like drugs, pharmaceuticals are designed. You can take a specific molecule that you want to make and you can come up with a sequence of reactions that actually makes this molecule. It's almost like trying to put it together with models. Um, we don't have the power to like put it together piece by piece the way we would models, but we might say that we have a molecule that looks like this and a molecule that looks like this, and we know that if we put these together, they'll connect in a particular way, and there are thousands of different reactions that we know, and we can use those to design exactly the molecule that we want. We can also use this chemistry to kind of tweak things. So like, let's say, this is a lot of times how pharmaceutical chemistry works. Somebody discovers that some random molecule from like a rare species of sea cucumber or something has some anti-cancer activity. Because you can grind that stuff up, you can isolate the compounds, and you can test them on cells in the lab, and people do this. And so you say, okay, we found that this molecule seems to have this activity, it's a good candidate for a pharmaceutical. Now you can't go like rounding up all the sea cucumbers in the world because there's maybe not that many of them. So somebody's got to figure out how to build this molecule. So they go to the organic chemists, organic chemists say, Here, or they say here's this molecule we found in the sea cucumber. Um, and and I, did, I did make that up, but like that's a common place for these kinds of things, just random like sea creatures and um, uh, plants and fun, fungi and all that kind of stuff. So they find this molecule, they say this thing maybe has anti-cancer activity, let's check it out. But we need enough of it that we can actually test it. So organic chemists come up with what's called a synthesis, which is a plan of how they're going to do a sequence of reactions, and it could be something like 30 reactions, step by step, to make this thing. And you know, some graduate student probably works on that for five years and figures out how to make, how to build this thing. Um, and that's great, and now we've got a synthesis, and now we can start testing it. So they make some stuff, they test it, and they realize that when you actually get into a biological system, it's a lot more complicated than just sticking it on a cell in the lab. So things like, um, there's a term called bioavailability. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. It has to do with how well the drug can actually get into your system. So maybe it has awesome properties when it's tested in a lab against a certain type of cell, but when you actually put it in a pill form and put it in a body, or an injection or whatever, it doesn't get where it needs to go because it can't dissolve properly or it can't penetrate into the cells properly or whatever. So they can go back to the organic chemists and say, design us a bunch of molecules that are basically the same as this one, but have some different pieces hanging off the ends or something like that. And organic chemists can make that. Using these types of reactions, we can kind of custom make different types of molecules. We can screen those molecules in the lab and then decide where the best candidates are, and this is how the process of drug development gets started. Um, then other things come up, like, well, this one's poisonous, so that's, you know, this one is going to be the perfect one, except it has these terrible side effects, so what do we do about that? Okay, let's go back and design some more molecules that are kind of like this. So that's kind of how that process uh, works and goes back and forth. But that all uses these types of reactions like we're going to see now, um, reactions where you start with one kind of organic molecule and you do something to it, to turn it into a slightly different molecule. So let's see some. We're going to look at two categories or two reactions um, of, uh, that are in this category of addition reaction. The first one is called hydrogenation. So hydrogenation means adding something to alkenes. What do you think it means that you're adding to an alkene? Hydrogen, yeah. So putting hydrogen on an alkene. And it looks like this. We take an alkene like ethane, or ethene, sorry. 
Here's our simplest alkene. Ethane, it's also known as ethylene. And to that, we are going to add hydrogen. So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen is Q, hydrogen gas, HH molecule. Yeah. Now, hydrogen by itself doesn't do anything to ethene because the activation energy is too high. Remember those graphs of the reactions where you have the big hump and you have to get over the hump? The hump for hydrogen and an alkene to react with each other is really, really high. It takes tons and tons of energy and actually ends up destroying the molecules in the process. So that doesn't work. So in order to get hydrogen to react with a, an alkene like ethene, we have to introduce a, a catalyst. And the catalyst that we use is some kind of heavy metal. Um, and the, the common ones that are used are platinum, palladium, or nickel catalysts. So you take a little bit of this ground up metal and you put it in the reaction with it. And suddenly that lowers the activation energy enough that this actually works. And the hydrogen adds to the alkene. So the product looks like this. We still have the C's and the H's from the original molecule. But what has changed is the electrons from the double bond and the electrons from the hydrogen molecule allow the hydrogens to actually bind to the carbons on the alkene. So sometimes we, we describe this as hydrogen adding across the double bond, and that means one hydrogen goes on one carbon, one hydrogen goes on the other carbon, and then we have this product. Now, one thing that these alkene reactions all have in common is there's no longer a double bond in the product. So those electrons from the double bond are used to do this kind of connection. And so there isn't going to be a, a double bond left anymore at the end of the reaction. So this molecule we've made at the end is called, you know, ethane. So we've turned ethene into ethane by adding hydrogen. This works for larger molecules as well. So if we had cyclopentene, Wait, I need two hydrogen on these guys. We can hydrogenate that as well. And let's just pick one. Let's say we use a platinum catalyst this time. Which one you pick depends on some factors like what temperature you need to do it at. Do you need it to do it to some double bonds and not other ones if it's a bigger molecule? Um, how expensive is it? That kind of thing. And our product is going to behave in the same way. We no longer have an alkene. We no longer have a double bond. Instead, we have... added those hydrogens across that double bond. So we now have cyclopentane. From cyclopentene to cyclopentane, that's how that reaction works. Now, as you know, usually we don't draw molecules out quite so explicitly. We use some abbreviations like um, condensed structures or line structures. So when this reaction would be written down, uh, like for communications in chemistry, for, for writing in a research journal or something like that, the reaction would look like this, exact same reaction. We would probably write it like this. We would make our cyclopentene a line structure. 
And with organic reactions, rather than thinking about them as this thing plus this thing equals products, or this thing plus this thing equals products, like we do with the other reactions we learned this semester, we think of this more as here is the thing we care about, the organic molecule, and then here are the reagents that we're going to do stuff to it and then change it. So in a lot of organic reactions, instead of seeing this plus this, we see this and then an arrow with some stuff on it and then the products. And the idea is you're, you're like treating it with the stuff on the arrow. So the same reaction in that type of notation would look like this. Takes up a lot less space that way, and is much obvious, uh, much more obvious and immediately apparent what's happening, what's changing when you write it that way. You can see that you start with the cyclopentene, you end with the cyclopentane. You've treated it with hydrogen and platinum. Those are the reagents. Can I move my bullets a little bit? The word we would usually use for this is starting material or reactive. The things that we're doing to it or adding to it are usually known as the reagents. And then this is the product. Since we're focusing on the changes to one molecule, we usually do it that way. Now you'll notice that when we write this reaction this way, one way you might describe it is the double bond goes away. You do this, you add hydrogen, the double bond goes away. And there's nothing wrong with thinking about it that way, because it's true, the double bond goes away. What is uh, an issue though, is forgetting that the thing that's making the double bond go away is adding the hydrogen. So that first uh, molecule in this example is C5H8. The second one is C5H10, or the product is C5H10. So we've added two hydrogens, even though we don't see them because we don't draw hydrogen from the line structures. We usually leave that out. All right, so questions about hydrogenation? So in an ideal world, if we thought about it the way we like, should think about it in chemistry terms, mm -hmm. we would just think about it as adding hydrogen instead of taking a couple of bonds with. Sure, but those both happen. So it's okay to think about both of those things okay. um, in that way. If it's written as line structures, it's easiest to just think of it as the double bond going away. But if you're thinking about it like this, or if you need to know the difference in formulas, then it makes more sense to think about the change in hydrogens. So however you, however you want to think about that is OK. All right, next reaction is hydration. So if hydrogenation is adding hydrogen, what do you think hydration is? Adding water, yeah. Like when you hydrate yourself, you add water, as I will do right now. So this reaction looks very similar, except instead of adding hydrogen, which is HH, we're going to add water, which we can think of as HOH. So let's see what that looks like. We'll start again with the simplest uh, ethene, which this reaction actually doesn't work really, um, but that's for different reasons, and we'll get into that. We're not going to get into that. So in this case, we're going to take our ethene and add, I'll keep the color coded here, H, O, H. And just as with the hydrate, hydrogenation, water doesn't just nicely add to ethene. The activation barrier is too high. So we need a catalyst again. 
This time, instead of a metal catalyst, we use an acid catalyst. So you'll usually see this is written as H plus or H3O plus, and that indicates an acid catalyst. And that's going to add in the same way that the hydrogen did. So one piece goes to one carbon and one piece goes to the other carbon, and that makes our product look like this. Keep the same material from the beginning. We add an H to one side and an OH to the other. So does it matter that I chose to put the H on the left and the OH on the right versus this? Are those the same or not? Yeah, they are, but what if there were three carbons? So in this example, those two are the same. Because if you flip one over, you get the same as the other one. But there are lots of molecules where that wouldn't be the case. They're only the same because of the symmetry of our initial molecule. Because if we cut this thing in half, it looks the same on both sides. There, We could probably think of other alkenes where that's not the case. So let's let's look at one of those and see what happens. So we're going to look at that same reaction with propene. Which is this. So three carbons in a row with a double bond. What happens if we do that same thing? We can write everything down the same way that we just did, but we need to recognize that there are two possible products now. There's this one, and there's this one. And if you think about that, those are no longer the same. The OH part being in the middle or being on the end is going to change the name of this molecule. So those are isomers. Because they're connected in a, diff in a different way. So they're isomers of each other. All right, so what do you think happens in the course of this reaction? Do you think that both of these are formed in equal amounts, like it's sort of a random thing? Or do you think one of them is, is favored over the other one? I mean, it's, it's hard to say, right? You have to kind of do the experiment and see. And in fact, in organic chemistry, there are lots of reactions that are favoring one or the other, and some that are not. Um, this particular example is one that does favor one over the other, and that concept is known as selectivity, specifically regioselectivity. You don't have to know that word. But it just means that one of these is going to be favored over another. And that's a good thing for doing organic chemistry, because remember, the goal of doing organic chemistry is to make a specific molecule that you want. So if you're doing 30 steps of reactions, and one of those steps gives you a 50-50 mixture of something you want and something you don't want, that means you've got to throw out half of what you're doing, and then you've cut down your potential yield at the end by a lot. So we really want reactions that are selective, that give us only the thing that, the, that we want, and this is an example of that. So as it turns out, this first one we wrote is favored.
Yeah, good question. Why? So the actual chemical reason behind that has to do with the mechanism of how this thing progresses and what's more stable, what's a more stable intermediate. For our purposes, we just need to kind of have a rule that we can follow and, and that makes sense. So our rule is that the favored sometimes called the major product has the OH sorry on the and the language we use is the more substituted carbon. We need to define that a little bit. The more substituted carbon is the one is the one with less hydrogen. So if you look at that first molecule, our very starting molecule, all the way over on the left, our propene, you've got two carbons in the double bond, and you see it's a hydration reaction, so you have to decide which carbon is the OH going to go on and which one is the H going to go on. Based on this rule, we want to put the OH on the more substituted carbon, which is the one that has less hydrogen. So that would be this one, right? This one has two hydrogens on it. This one has one hydrogen on it. So the OH is going to go to that one. That's our more substituted carbon. And that one gets our OH for our favorite product. This is another example of where it's actually usually easier to see when we simplify it to the line structures. So if we draw the same reaction in line structures, it looks like this. Here's propene. We're going to react it with water and an acid catalyst. And our major product is this one. And our minor product is this one. Because chemistry is chemistry, uh, there's no absolutes usually. And we're not going to only make that one product that we want, but we're going to make a lot more of it. So you will also have evidence of this other product that is not favored, but that's why we don't use words like we form this one and we do not form this one. We use words like favored product or major product because we will still get some of the other stuff in there. But our major product is gonna be the one where that OH can be connected to the carbon with the most other carbons connected to it. So the re reverse of saying the OH goes to the one with the less hydrogen is saying the OH goes to the one with the more carbons on it. So let's try that. I'm going to give you a couple hydration reactions to look at, and you're going to try to draw, or you can try to draw the major product for each of them. This one's a little bit different in that I want you to figure out what molecule started, we started with to make that particular product.
do it down those products and really on the So remember that the OH is going to go to one side and the H is to the other side. But when we're using line structures, we don't specify the hydrogens. We don't draw out all the hydrogens. So that's why you don't see those in the um, example above. All right, you got some uh, products here. So for the first one, we use that same technique, and we say, look at the double bond, look at both sides. Which one has the more carbons coming off of it? This one, right? So that's where our OH is going to go. Sorry, that kind of looks like a double bond. I was just retracing it. It should be a single bond. And that's our product. Second one, same thing. We look at both sides. We see one that has more. Now I put the OH there. We should also, like with the previous reaction, we want to kind of have a sense in our brain that 
the H goes here, like this one has one H attached here, and here we now have two H's attached here. So we did add both H and OH, but because we're using these line structures, the hydrogen kind of gets collapsed down onto the carbon and we don't, don't draw it. Yeah? You're not made a major and minor? No. So in this case, I just asked for a major product. So yeah. Um, it would, if it says draw all possible products and label the major and minor one, you would do it, but normally we would just draw the major product. So in this next one, we have to figure out what thing we have to start with to make this product. So anybody find one? Let me move this over a little bit. There are two possible pro uh, reactants that you might start with to make this. Um, one of them is right, and one of them is not. So there's this. Or this. They both have double bonds in them at that carbon where the OH ends up being. So those are both possibilities. One of them is not a great choice, though, and, and why? And the other one is a better choice. Anybody see why? The bottom one could be a better choice because otherwise there's four. It would, um, yeah. would go up instead of unbound. Right. If we started with this one, remember, based on that rule, we would expect the OH to go here instead. If we really want that OH to be down here, this is the better choice because either corner that it adds at actually makes that same product because it's symmetric. So this is the better choice here. And um, just to be totally correct, that is not exactly true. Um, what would actually happen is the OH would actually jump up to this one, but that's beyond the scope of this class Y. So we'll just keep that as an example. All right, so that's alkene reactions. Any questions? So if you go on and take organic chemistry, you'll get to learn a whole bunch more of the stuff, um, which sounds fun, right? All kinds of different reactions, different ways to do this, and you learn these things called mechanisms where you draw these little arrows to determine how everything fits together, and it's a lot of fun. So I would recommend it. All right. Our next topic, last topic uh, for this chapter, Aromatic compounds. Kind of sounds like things that smell, and that is where the name originally comes from. It, this was a class of, com of compounds that had all kinds of interesting smells. It has now been broadened to include a lot of other things, so in a chemical sense, aromatic doesn't really mean smell anymore. What it does mean um, is this. Aromatic compounds contain rings, like cyclic compounds, with alternating double and single bonds. And it's a little more complicated than that when you get into the details of it, but for our purposes, that's a good definition. So we're talking about things like this. You could take a cyclohexane and instead of adding the hydrogens and just calling it cyclohexane, we have alternating double and single bonds inside the molecule. Like that. So that means that each carbon is going to get one hydrogen. And we have that kind of a thing. The molecular formula is C6H6. 
And the name of this molecule is benzene. So it is important that this is not cyclohexane. Cyclohexane refers to C6H12, which doesn't have any double bonds. It could be named cyclohexatriene, because it has three double bonds in it. One, three, five, cyclohexatriene. But it has its own special name because it has its own special properties. What happens in this molecule, if we draw it as a line structure, like this, is there are two ways to draw this molecule. You could draw it like that, like we just did, or you could flip all the double bonds around and draw it like that. Those look the same, and they are, really. But on a molecular level, like if you were actually to look at the molecule that were right here in front of us, we could say that there's a difference between those. Either the double bond is here, or it's here, or it's here, or it's here. So there's, there's a difference between those two structures, even though they're functionally the same. So it used to be thought that this kind of happened really fast, that the structure was flipping back and forth from one form to the other all the time. Now we know that's not really true. What's happening instead is there's not really individual double bonds and single bonds in the structure at all. In fact, the whole thing is kind of mixed together. And each bond is like one and a half bonds. So it's sort of like those two structures got meshed together and mixed up and hybridized or something. So another way we often draw the structure because of that is with a circle in the middle. And that indicates the same thing. That's another way of drawing benzene that shows this kind of behavior of these double bonds going around. So when you see that hexagon with the circle in the middle, that's not cyclohexane. That's the special aromatic compound called benzene. So what's special about this kind of electronic um, configuration, this way that that these things go is that this is very stable, much more stable than the alkenes. The alkene reactions we just talked about, benzene doesn't do those. It needs special extra strong reagents to react with because having these alternating double bonds that are kind of mixed together in this nice situation makes this a particularly stable compound. It's also, um, it's, it's nonpolar, but because of its, because of how uh, the electrons are, are arranged in here, it's a very good solvent for a lot of other things that have double bonds. Um, and so you'll see these types of structures all throughout the world, uh, in biological molecules, in hydrocarbons, in all kinds of places we find these molecules. They're important parts of uh, pharmaceuticals, everything from like ibuprofen to methamphetamine has this structure in it because it's a basic building block of, of a lot of types of organic molecules. The other thing it does is um, it is a carcinogen. You know what that means? Yeah, it can cause cancer. Well, the structure isn't everything, but only the isolated molecule is a carcinogen. So when there's other stuff attached to it, it's no longer carcinogenic because then our body can break it down appropriately. However, there are a lot of structures that are based on benzene that we do see a lot of that are still carcinogenic. So you've got benzene, and then what happens a lot is these benzene molecules kind of get hooked together like this. Like a honeycomb type arrangement. 
Now, if that goes on and on to infinity, or at least way, way big, you have what's called graphite. You have carbon graphite, because where those uh, rings link up, there's no hydrogen. So if that just went on and on and on and on, you'd have pure graphite, which is just carbon. But what usually happens instead, or what can happen instead, is you have these isolated molecules that are like little tiny pieces of graphite. And these are caused by, are formed by uh, incomplete combustion, usually. So remember our combustion reactions that we did? What's a combustion reaction? Again, it's just a hydrocarbon plus oxygen, and the products are carbon dioxide and water. So think about that. Carbon dioxide and water it's water vapor, too. So when you burn something, technically, you shouldn't see anything there anymore because it's all turned into carbon dioxide and water vapor, which you can't see. But if you set a log on fire or something, what happens when it's done burning? What do you, what, what's still there? Ash, or like charcoal, that kind of stuff, right? Black stuff. So that is, uh, that is partially graphite. And it's a lot of these kinds of molecules of different sizes. Um, when you don't have enough oxygen present to convert everything to carbon dioxide, a lot of the carbon, or some of the carbon, ends up in these types of forms. So this is why um, byproducts of combustion are often carcinogenic. So when we, when we talk about like cigarette smoke um, and having tons and tons of different chemicals in the cigarette smoke, a lot of that is from anytime you burn anything, you end up forming these types of molecules due to the incomplete combustion. Um, and so the, the more you get that inside yourself, the more exposure you have to potential carcinogens. So that's why things like smoking are bad for you, eating a lot of smoked foods is not great. Um, because of that as well. In fact, over the years, when when food was more regional, there was some work done with some mapping that showed higher instances of stomach cancers in regions that relied on more smoked foods, um, smoked fishes and, and smoked meats for diets. Um, any pretty much any time you like cook something and get that nice kind of brownish layer, crispy black part um, when you put it on the grill or whatever. A lot, there's a lot of that going on there. So um, not, not to scare you specifically, but in, to that then, let's talk a little bit about what it means for something to be a carcinogen. So we haven't watched the video on that in this class, have we? The what causes cancer video thing? Okay, let's look at that real quick. It's a short video, but I think it does a good job of some examples into this. Oh, I have to change this. How worried should you be when something gets... Okay. okay. How worried should you be when something gets slapped with the label probably causes cancer? It's a classification that makes for easy headlines, as chemicals that were previously thought to be not so bad are outed as seemingly potential killers. Yet as we'll see, just because something might cause cancer doesn't mean that it necessarily will. One of the more prominent organizations that evaluate carcinogens is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC for short. IARC publishes doorstop-sized reports, they call them monographs, that evaluate the evidence for or against something having the ability to cause cancer. These monographs are the culmination of a long and arduous process. Leading experts huddle together for days at a time and carefully sift through publicly available data. They look at whether there's evidence for a specific agent causing cancer in people. They look to see if there's any evidence for it causing cancer in animals. They examine whether there are scientific reasons to think it might cause cancer. And they weigh the evidence, which is really black and white, to determine whether on balance there's a chance that the agent could cause cancer given the right circumstances. At the end of this process, the substance or agent under examination is given a number from 1 to 4. 
First, there are the group one substances. These are the bad actors where the data are pretty clear that exposure to enough of them could lead to cancer. All right, a couple important things there. So this is where our benzene fits in, known human carcinogen. But look at how they describe that, which is, which is correct. The evidence supporting that kind of looks like this, which means there's a good amount of evidence that says, yep, it definitely can cause cancer. But there's also plenty of evidence that says, we're not sure. So that's why it's important to look at these things over a long period of time, multiple studies. That's, that's how science is done. It's not about you do one thing and you go, okay, we figured it out, it's good. Um, it's about accumulating evidence and seeing what is the weight, how does the weight of that accumulated evidence point. At the other end of the spectrum, there's group four. This is where they put the stuff where the balance of evidence suggests that they don't cause cancer. Just about this is group three. Here you'll find substances where there just isn't enough evidence to indicate that they are carcinogenic. And then there's group two. Group two is the tricky one. These are the substances where there are hints that they might cause cancer, but the data aren't conclusive. Group two is divided into probable carcinogens and possible carcinogens. If there's evidence that a substance can cause cancer in animals, but the jury's out on humans, it's likely to be labeled as a possible carcinogen and placed into group 2b. On the other hand, if the data on cancer in humans is just a little stronger, but still not conclusive, the substance is likely to be put in group 2a and labeled a probable carcinogen. In effect, ending up in group 2 is the equivalent of IOC slapping a take care label on something. They're letting you know that under some circumstances, if you're exposed to enough of the stuff, you might get cancer. Plenty of common substances end up with this take care label. Eat fried food, for instance, and you're probably ingesting acrylamide, an ion probable carcinogen. Spray your weeds with the herbicide Roundup, and you're using the ion labeled probable carcinogen glyphosate. Interestingly, working as a hairdresser and working shifts that disrupt your body's rhythms are also both listed as probable carcinogens. Then there's coffee, gasoline, and wait for it, pickled vegetables. Each of these are listed by IARC as potential carcinogens. In effect, an IARC label indicating something is a potential or a probable carcinogen doesn't mean that it will necessarily cause cancer. And it certainly doesn't mean stop using it. The label is only half the story. It suggests what could happen, but it doesn't indicate how likely it is. It's the equivalent of saying a rock could kill you, but not pointing out that it probably needs to be dropped on your head for a great height first. To make sense of these labels, additional information is needed on what probable actually means, together with how much stuff people are exposed to, and how much of it is needed to cause cancer. In other words, the label alone shouldn't worry you. We're exposed all the time to substances that may cause cancer, that's unavoidable, but neither should IARC labels be taken lightly. They indicate what might be a problem. The real challenge, and this is where risk assessment comes in, is working out how to prevent that might be from turning into an is, either by keeping exposures to safe levels, replacing the substance with something less harmful, or getting rid of it altogether. That, though, is a decision that needs more information than just the IR assessment can provide. There. Um, there's a whole series of these videos which are really good from uh, University of Michigan's Risk Science Center, um, where I went to school, and they they uh, uh, talk about a lot of these different issues. Um, I think this one in particular. So, like, let's talk about what that means in relationship to the chemicals that we just talked about. So, these things are these category one known human carcinogens. That means that they are known to cause cancer in humans. Does that mean? that they will cause cancer in you if you um, come in contact with them. Not really, right? Because there's a couple of factors there. One is dose, so how much are you getting? The other is how does your body deal with that? I mean, think of, we all know people who like smoked their whole lives and lived until their 90s or something like that. Or I don't know if we all do, but some people do. So it's like they're definitely, ingesting carcinogens at high doses for a long period of time and yet not getting cancer. And that's just human variation. So 
the idea that something can cause cancer versus will cause cancer gets in this idea of, of hazard versus risk. The hazard is something that something is pot potentially capable of doing. The risk is how likely is it that that will happen. And I really like their, um, where is it? Their rock analogy here, right? That a rock is a hazard, but unless it's dropped on you from a great height, it's probably not going, it's not a risk. A rock sitting there is not a risk um, to you in that way. And this 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 thing as well. That something might have the potential to cause harm, but there's this rest of the story. And I think that we kind of lose sight of this this time, uh, a lot of the time. When we think about this is a dangerous thing, we must avoid every bit of it at all costs. That's not really what, what this is saying. So you may be perfectly safe even if you are exposed to known carcinogens because of all these other factors. Um, so things like, well, well, this happens a lot even with, with kind of unknown things. Like, have you ever heard about this sort of broad variety of substances known as toxins? And you're supposed to get the toxins out of your system, and there's lots of advertising about how you, what sort of teas you need to drink to get the toxins out of your system or whatever, um, cleanses and, su and such. So that's, that's assuming that there are some sorts of dangerous molecules inside of you that are causing harm and they're at, at the dose that they're at and they need to be removed, right? But really that's not happening because we have livers and the livers take care of our toxins, right? And if they didn't, we'd be in trouble. So the livers are the things that are detoxifying us all the time. And if there were other things in there causing us harm, um, well, that would, that would be a problem. So um, that's that's kind of what this is what this is speaking to. They also had some interesting examples, I think, about the different things that, that sometimes we don't think about. Um, they mention this quickly, even though there's not a separate picture of it, but they talk about disrupting your body's rhythms, like working at night or just staying up late a lot and not getting enough sleep is actually a carcinogen. It's a probable car carcinogen. Increases your cancer risk. But we sometimes don't think about things like that. Um, when we talk, when we uh, think about cancer risk and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Is that that? Who's again? Who's quiet today? All right. So we'll have a quiz on next Thursday. Next Tuesday will be checkout, review, and going over the exam. And then we're done. Well, final exam. And then we're done. We're almost there. What? It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, I should have the rest of the labs posted by tomorrow. So if you're missing anything still uh, after that, let me know. Remember that you dropped the last two labs, or the bottom two labs. So I think everybody's in pretty good shape on that. Uh, yeah, have a great uh, weekend before the last week of classes.